Some of us will be gathering later to remember those that we've lost in the lead up to Trans Day of Remembrance, which is tomorrow. For now, though, I'd like to rest in Trans Awareness Week for just one more hour. And so that is in some ways what this talk is about. My name is Alex and my pronouns are they, them, or just my name. I transitioned towards male some 13 years ago. I was living in Liverpool at the time. I've just been at the community TDOR event in the Museum of Liverpool, which reminded me that the last time I was there was when a photo of me was in the, um, the, the April Ashley exhibition um, back in 2012. And I cannot believe that that was so, so long ago. I am a minister in the United Reformed Church and I currently minister in what's called a special category role in Cambridge City Centre, which basically means I'm a minister who mostly works outside of the church. I work in City Centre chaplaincy, I support Cambridge Open Table and I'm collaborating to shape two new communities. Cambridge Solidarity Hub, which works on social and eco-justice, and the Trumpington Gathering, um, which is a spiritual community that meets in a forest. I'm also co-chair of the Open Table Network alongside the wonderful Sarah Hobbs. For me, being trans and non-binary and queer is inextricably intertwined with being a person of faith, and a person whose faith is inspired by Jesus and lived out as a part of the diverse, amorphous, constantly reforming body of Christ. Perhaps I'm part of a limb, or maybe just a few cells of skin on the inside of Christ's wrist. I digress, but the one thing I know for sure is that I'm somewhere in the whole glorious mess. And that for me necessitates moving beyond binaries. It necessitates queering norms. It necessitates speaking authentically about who I am even after 13 years, even when it stings, even when it burns, even when it leads to threats and genuine palpable risk. A decade or so in transition, I realized that there were very, very few books to read about theology from a trans perspective but also that I hadn't really had any prolonged or intentional conversations with other trans people about what it means to be human more broadly, or about how I or we perceive God. All of our conversations were stuck in how to explain that it was okay to be ourselves. It was difficult to get beyond that societal barrier. So I decided to do a PhD which is possibly a dubious life choice. <laughs> I have since learned that people do actually have conversations with each other outside of academic study. My thesis was entitled Transformations and was an exploration of the theologies and theological anthropologies, in other words, understandings of God and understandings of humans, of 10 diverse trans and non-binary people, including my own insights. It'll be published in May next year by SCM Press, and I will keep you in the loop. But that's enough promotion. As I've transitioned and continue to transition into the person who I am, new in each mo moment, my standpoint, the particular context in which I find myself, has always been a part of that shaping and reshaping. And so as I speak to you about the present and future of trans theology today, I will speak about the importance of writing from a trans standpoint. How I have been viewed throughout my life has affected how I understand the world. So I will speak to you about the effects of prevailing narratives about trans people on our theological understandings. And throughout my life, I have felt that many of the tropes that cis people often identify trans people by don't fit me and didn't fit many of my PhD participants. So I will also speak about the ways in which some of these tropes are challenged. And finally, when training for ministry, I was shocked by the lack of trans written theology. So I will also speak about how some of the folks I've worked with understand God and what I believe is next for trans theology. So standpoints, apologies um, to anyone who knows some of this stuff already. Your standpoint is in some ways where you are. 
So say all of these people are standing somewhere around a mountain. Um, their point of view is affected by the fact that they're standing around a mountain, um, but each of them has a different point of view from the others too. So the person standing at the bottom of the mountain about to climb it, kind of looking and thinking, oh my goodness, why am I doing this? Has a different point of view from the person who's part way up to the person who stood at the top, having done some of the hard work, although we all know that coming down a mountain is actually, well, if you don't know this, coming down a mountain is just as hard, if not harder, than going up. And the person at the bottom who's off to a cafe or a pub. But standpoints are about more than just where you are. They're also about who you are. That person at the top of the mountain is going to have a different understanding of what they've just done if they're a hiker, doing it all the time, or a tourist, first time I've ever climbed a mountain, a widow taking a journey of grief, or perhaps someone fundraising. The person who climbed the mountain, and it took seven long hours, is going to have a different standpoint, a different point of view from the person who got the cable chair up to the top. Standpoint theory says that there is no view from nowhere. Where we are and who we are matters. And so who theology is written by and where those people are also matters. It affects our points of view, it affects what we have to say and it affects why we're saying it. And I think that trans and non-binary standpoints particularly matter because they have the power to impact how we see humanity, or ha-adam, which is Hebrew for the humans or humanity, and how we see God. So firstly, ha-adam, the human. If every person who writes about what it means to be human is writing from a cis perspective, and from a perspective in which binaries, male and female, seem obvious, then our understanding of being human is going to emphasise those binaries and is going to emphasise what it is like um, to uh, live in the same uh, expression or identity in terms of gender as your gender observed at birth. Um, so it's really important that humans of varying genders are able to talk about what it means to be human. But beyond that, it's really important because I think that we're at risk of crucially misunderstanding the Genesis creation narratives. Now, when I start to talk about this in liberal or progressive spaces, people often say, well, why are we even talking about the Genesis creation narratives, right? They'll say, well, it's just a myth, so we don't need to talk about it. I have an issue with those three words, just a myth. Myths contain truths and they tend to be really important, really deep truths that often underlie or weave between scientific facts. Factual truth is constantly changing. It's one of the truths about science that what it says today might not be what it says tomorrow. There's constant progress, regress, change. Myths are the things that have the power to potentially remain constant in that kind of fluidity or creativity or magic of truth that can underlie some of those scientific movements. And I think that the Genesis creation myths contain particularly powerful truths. And I don't think that they're the truths of gender complementarianism or the truths of binary gender or what's called sexual dimorphism at all. So sexual dimorphism is the idea that everyone is created either male or female, and it's not found at all in the Genesis creation narratives. If you read the Genesis creation narratives in Hebrew, you will see throughout, right until that cosmic um, operation after uh, Ha'adam has named the animals in Genesis 2, you know, two by two they went into the ark. Well, before that, Ha'adam, the human, named them. Um, but until then, Ha'adam isn't Adam. It's not a man. Throughout the first chapter and quite a bit of the second chapter of Genesis, 
This word, ha'adam, the human, which is sometimes translated as humanity, is consistently used. It's a collective term, which means that it can be referring to a single person or it can be referring to multiple people. If our Genesis creation narratives are any like any of the other numerous creation um, narratives that occurred around about the same time or since, it's entirely probable that Ha-Adam was an androgynous creature. And that rings true in the Hebrew, particularly in Genesis 2. Because in Genesis 2, um, we have this, what I call a divine naming game, um, where Ha-Adam, the human, has been told by God that they have to give names to all the animals, which just seems really quite random to me. But anyway, so they go on naming all of these animals, but there's a secret rule, right? The secret rule of the game is that as they're giving the animals a name, they're supposed to find one as a partner. That word partner has been unhelpfully translated um, as helpmeet, which has led to a kind of anti-feminist um, theologies. But if you pull the Hebrew apart, it perhaps most accurately translates as another one mirroring them. Another one mirroring them. So there's this sense in which Ha-Adam, the human, has to go around naming all of these animals and the secret of the game is that they're supposed to find the one mirroring them. Unsurprisingly, they didn't quite get there. And what happens? God changes their mind. And if you think that's not possible, it's throughout scripture. There are multiple verses throughout the Bible where it says, and God changed God's mind. Um, so God changes God's mind and there's this kind of divine operation. The masculine and the feminine is pulled out of Ha-Adam, the human. And it's only after that point that we hear the human referring to themselves as Ish, male, and Isha, female. That point, kind of halfway through Genesis 2, is the first time that we ever get gender mentioned in that really explicit way um, in the Genesis creation narratives. In Genesis 1, we get this sense of masculinity and femininity that's kind of described as an adjective rather than a, a substance, a thing. But those words, man and woman, aren't even used until partway through Genesis 2. And we have this word partner, a partner mirroring them. So there's this sense in which um, Ish, the man perhaps, isn't able to name himself in a gendered way until there's this other part drawn out, this Isha, this woman. And some people would use that to point to complementarianism, but I think it points much more to the similarities as well as the differences between humanity, much more to our androgynous nature, um, which is seen in the womb. God knows us before we are sexed, never mind gendered, the Psalms remind us. So I think that it's important to read the Genesis creation narratives from a trans and non-binary standpoint, because several of the trans and non-binary people that I spoke to throughout my PhD pointed to these multiple ways of reading Genesis and pointed to the Genesis creation narratives as being central to our own understandings of what it means to be ourselves. Not because we reach to Genesis for some sense of scientific truth, but because we reach to Genesis for some sort of story that has something to tell us about being human, about what it means to live with unity in diversity, about what it means that we're all essentially made of the same stuff and we're all basically completely different. But theology um, is actually talking about God. The problem is that humans mirror God, which is kind of a really wonderful thing. But, but the problem with that is that if all the humans who are writing and speaking about God are older, white, cis, het, men, then we're going to get this image of God as an older, white, cis, het man. Um, if humans image God, then the types of humans that speak about God impacts the type of God that we see. If we mirror God, then the God we describe will inevitably mirror us. 
And so if our understandings of God rely on any individual one of us, then we're going to be missing something. One of my interview participants explained it like this. They talked about a many-sided dice. You know those dice you get if you do gaming, like D&D or something? They have lots and lots and lots of sides. Um, they were talking about a hundred-sided dice, but they're really quite silly, actually. They're very difficult to roll, the hundred-sided dice. So I prefer to think of one that has 20 sides. That's quite a satisfying shape to fiddle with. And when you hold up a 20-sided dice, you can kind of see the number here in the middle, and you know, if you've rolled it, that's the number you're supposed to play. And you can sort of see some other numbers around the side, but there's all these numbers on the reverse side that you can't see, right? And if someone was sitting opposite you on the other side of the table, they'd be able to see those other sides of the dice. My interview participant said that that was a little bit what theology was like. That was a bit like what it was like to talk about God, because I can only see the sides that I can see, and Sarah can only see the sides that she can see, and Kieran can only see the sides that he can see, and it's in talking to each other and gathering all of these diverse images and understandings of God that we start to understand maybe just a tiny fraction of who and what God is. So if there were no theological texts written by trans and non-binary people, then is it any wonder that we imaged God firstly as male, as father, and then as female, as mother, and totally neglected to realize that God is both entirely gender full, encompassing the whole of what it means to be gendered, and God is also entirely genderless, entirely not trapped by any of what it means to be gendered. And the thing is, when you read it from a trans perspective, this isn't particularly progressive or new, it's in the Bible. One of my favorite verses, bizarrely, is from Leviticus. I never thought I'd say that. Um, but I was reading Leviticus one day. I think it's Leviticus. It's either Leviticus or Deuteronomy, which are both, you know, just as complicated. But when you're reading, um, you come across this wonderful bit and it says, you have disrespected God, the rock that gave you birth. You have disrespected God, the rock that gave you birth. The rock there is in masculine form. Um, every inanimate object is described in Hebrew in masculine form. But here we have the rock that gave you birth, the stone that broke open to give us life. So there's a sense in which God is described beyond gender and also containing all of gender in the Bible um, that you won't find uh, in theological texts that are already out there. I also think that trans standpoints matter because the narratives um, the ways of understanding the world um, that we live with have an effect on our theological understandings. So I kind of took the interviews um, that I did and had a look at what are the overarching narratives that are going on here. And it was actually quite plain to see that for some people, their understandings of their lives were very much informed by suffering very much informed by all of the difficult things that they had experienced. For some, their understandings were very much um, based on resilience, on this sense of being able to continue on through all of those things. And for some of my participants, their understandings were very much informed by a sense of joy and a sense of play. And that isn't simply to say that some of my participants really suffered and some of my participants um, were lucky enough not to. It wasn't that straightforward. All of them described quite a lot of suffering and all of them described quite a lot of joy. But the ways in which other people had treated them and the ways in which they'd experienced other people speaking about what it means to be trans and or non-binary had impacted the way that they spoke about themselves, the way that they spoke about other humans, and the way that they spoke about God. And so I wonder what it does to trans and non-binary people's theological understandings when you Google trans or non-binary and hit the news tab and every single item that comes up is somehow pathologizing. 
I wonder what it does to trans and non-binary people's theological understandings on TDOR when we see the slideshow with the list of names and it also has all of the causes of death on it and, you know, we need to honour people, but actually, what does that do to us? And what does it do to our understandings of theology as trans and non-binary people when one of the top headlines this week in Trans Week of Awareness um, was to say that the Pope has said that trans people can be baptised? Hang on a second. Could we not be baptised before? Are we not human? How other people see us has an impact on our experiences of life and our understandings. The person whose narrative was most strongly affected by themes of suffering and who effectively understood being trans as basically a whole um, big kind of pile of suffering, for that person actually the cross was the centre of their theology. And that's not wrong, it's kind of inevitable. Um, because they had experienced so much suffering, they could empathise with a God who had suffered. Um, and also because they had experienced so much suffering, they could empathize, for example, um, with some of the mystics who speak and write a lot about suffering. Um, and for them, actually, when people were trying to talk to them about this God who's all about hope and light and joy and life, they were like, no. You know, that, that meant absolutely nothing to them. And that's why it's so important to understand the narratives that inform people's lived um, experiences, because it will affect what theologies um, make sense to them. And it was really important for this person that God was about suffering, actually. And then the person who experienced the most joy, for them, God was all about play and experimenting. Um, for them, uh, transition, they described as following breadcrumbs of delight. This sense of following the joy um, that God is setting out for them. For them, theology was playful. Anything written down, probably my thesis, you know, as soon as it was written down, it's pointless. You've got to play with it. Their theology was um, impacted by the, the understandings of joy that they had used to frame their identity. When I asked them, but what about the cross? They were like, nah, not, not going there. That's not helpful for me. So actually, we need to understand the effects of narrative on theology. But I also think we need to think really carefully about the narratives that are out there and how we're going to challenge them. because. It is really problematic to be stuck in a narrative of suffering. And if all that trans people read about themselves is through, you know, the news or social media or ecclesial denominations, then we're going to be stuck in that cycle uh, uh, of writing our stories around the theme that suffering is the core thing that it means to be trans. Um, and that's not a good place to be. So I strongly believe that churches need to start to share different narratives need to start to speak positively and joyfully about trans disciples. Um, we need to, to start to talk about transness in ways that don't rely um, only on days like Tidor, only on the days where we are mourning. We need to actually start to talk about the days that we're playing or exploring or enjoying. The next thing that happened um, in my research is that it kind of undermined quite a lot of tropes, and I think this is really important. And it's not that these tropes haven't been undermined elsewhere. Um, they are undermined in some sociological stuff about being trans, but not in theology. So most books you read about trans theology, including books that are written um, in support of trans people, and even some books that are written by trans people, still very much rely on these tropes. Um, these books are books that I would describe as trans apologetic, which means that they're books that explain why it's okay to be trans or non-binary. They're books that are kind of feeding into this sense of debate about being trans. And don't get me wrong, they're needed. Um, I wouldn't have been able to enter into this work without those books existing. They are needed, but it's really interesting, particularly where they're written by people who are not trans, that they carry these tropes um, that simply aren't straightforwardly true of all trans people. 
And there were four tropes that were kind of particularly um, called out, really, by my research participants. The first one was the wrong body trope. The, now, it's not that all trans people love our bodies. Um, most of us have periods of struggling with bits of our bodies um, in, in moments in time. Um, many of us change our bodies in some way or form, but many of us don't. Um, but I don't think anyone I talked to had this kind of straightforward sense of, well, my whole body is wrong and changing it is the most important thing about being trans. Um, rather, folks that I spoke to had complicated relationships with their bodies um, and with different parts of them. Um, and people had complicated understandings about transition and surgery um, and people's understandings about what they needed had changed over time in just about every direction that you can imagine um, and people's understandings were still changing. Um, so this kind of wrong body idea was just too simplistic um, and I would link that to the one just below it which is the idea of discontinuity. Um, so this is often summed up in language like sex change or sex swap, this idea that you transition and then there's this wall and there's like the before I transitioned bit and the after I transitioned bit and you know I must have nothing to do with this before bit once I'm in this after bit. Um, now one of my participants very much did have that experience um, but it wasn't the dominant experience. For most of us there was just more complexity and there was this sense of a continuing thread through our lives. There was this sense of connection between past and present, and there was a sense of really wanting to work out what that meant, not wanting to kind of deny our past, but to actually work out how we could journey authentically between um, past and present through transition. This was particularly prevalent um, amongst participants who identified as non-binary. Um, certainly for me, being non-binary is in part about having reconciled um, past, present and future and realising that for me there's no such thing as a static maleness to reach. Uh, the transition for me is something that's ongoing um, in just about every direction imaginable. Um, related to those, we can kind of come down to the other bottom corner, dysphoria. Um, life was more complicated than that, you know? Lots of us, probably most of us, had dysphoria about some parts of our bodies at some times. Um, most of them weren't about the parts of our bodies you might imagine. They're about all sorts of different things. Um, and some didn't experience dysphoria at all. For some, transition was, was really euphoria-based. It was really that sense of what am I journeying towards rather than what am I journeying away from. Um, more to the point, this sense of dysphoria being social as well as clinical or embodied um, really came up in my studying. So several people, for example, had experienced dysphoria that they felt was embodied and then when they socially transitioned that dysphoria had actually lessened to a certain degree, um, which wasn't to say that they didn't then also feel the need to take some clinical steps, um, but transition primarily wasn't about oh, quick, I need clinical steps as soon as possible. It was actually about how other people in society, and particularly those people close to them, saw themselves. Um, so when everything that we see in the media around being trans is framed around clinical um, care, uh, that's not reflected in the realities of trans lives. And then the final one I want to come to is individualism. Um, I don't know how much folks will have heard this one, um, but a lot of trans folks have experienced being called out for being selfish. Transness is often understood as selfishness. Um, if you look in any kind of academic search site and put transgender and selfish in, you get hundreds of articles um, about by why being trans is supposedly an individualistic process um, that is ignorant of those around us. That was the one trope that did not hold water for any single one of my interview participants. Transition is deeply social and deeply to do with relationships and connections. Every single one of my participants had at some point in time um, delayed or altered plans around transition in relation to those around them. 
all of us had come to realizations about our gender in relation to other people and their genders. Um, and for all of us, there was a, a reliance um, actually on social structures, systems and groups um, in order to be able to transition at all. Um, for many, transition wasn't about how I see myself and needing to line up my body or my visible identity with this kind of self-understanding. It was about what I was communicating to someone else, the importance of being able to converse with people, of being able to share things about ourselves, of being able to stand up and speak, for example, um, that actually people were driven to communicate and without transition of some type, that communication, there was a block. So the purpose of transition was actually not individualistic, um, but primarily social. And that was really important to be able to pull out because it is very common. So almost any um, anti-trans Christian text that you read will talk about transness as being individualistic. Um, and it simply doesn't seem uh, to match reality. Now this screen is actually supposed to be blank, so you're all right. So what I did um, once I'd gathered these 10 people's understandings was I wrote theology and I wrote it in two ways. Um, I wrote it factually, so I wrote kind of, you know, um, this is the case and this is the case, but I also wrote it in story and I was planning to read the leave the story bit out um, of what I published, um, but apparently some people like the story bit. So I'm going to share the, the theology in story with you now, but this was just kind of a summary of some of the key points um, that came up as I was speaking and working with people um, on this. God dances with us. They leap and twirl and spin. They hold our hands gently as they follow our first tentative steps, then grip our waists firmly as they lead us in a daring twist and bend. God, you see, is neither leader nor follower, both leader and follower, neither male nor female, both male and female. God is gender full and genderless, an ambiguous, fleshless being who leaps into fleshy delight to join in our dance. God is under our skin, in our skin, gently breathing on our skin. Our God cannot be separated from us or contained within us. Even as we feel God's embrace, we cannot define or confine them. God will not be caged. We want to keep God still so that we can understand them. Cautiously separating ourselves from God, backing off from the dance, goosebumps rising on our chilled skin, we run to our tool sheds to grab the bars which we have built out of words and theories, like Father, Him, theocentric, kingdom, law, son, atonement, sanctification, exemplar, spirit, justification, eschatological, realization, church. These words and theories feel strong in our aching hands. God sits still as we construct arrogant theological walls and cages around them. They will not disrupt our freedom to name and confine. When we are finished, we sit back and admire our work, occasionally pausing to throw the odd stone at people who dare to question or live in ways that undermine our construction. We feel safe. It is easier not to dance with God. It is easier to keep them at a distance. But the people who question and deconstruct keep coming back and threatening to tear down the box. Our pile of stones dwindle and some of our number even leave, leave to join them. The more we shiver in fear, the harder we lob our lumps of rubble and ruin. Then, one day, some people dance up to the cage, enclosed in mirrors, as they encircle it, we step away from our stones, curious 
to observe them. Their dancing looks fun. We edge closer and closer, carrying a box in each hand. In one box, we keep our minds, separated from our trembling bodies, so that we do not risk sin. In the other box, we keep our past, separated from our tenuous present, so that we do not risk contamination. As we approach the others, we realize that they do not have any boxes. Where are your boxes? We demand, terrified and bewildered as we stare at their empty hands. We do not need boxes, one of them responds. Our minds are swirled into our bodies, insep inseparable from our very selves. Our pasts are the root cells on which our present flesh grows, continuously transformed and transforming ourselves and each other. Our hands are open and empty, ready to receive and join in with the complexity and apparent contradictions of the dance. As we listen, we remember the dance. As we watch the others dance, we catch glimpses of ourselves in the mirrors, static, and staring, trembling and tenuous. Some of our feet start to tap. We want to join in, but our hands are full of boxes. We cannot dance. We feel like aliens, like no one here is quite like us. We try to put down our boxes but we can't do it. We're stuck, staring in incomprehension and dismay at the boxes of words that we have built to cage in our pasts, our minds and our God. We grip our boxes tighter until they begin to dig into our flesh. As the others dance round and round, I spot one that looks a bit like me. Fragments of who I am, of all that I've lived through and hope to become, of what I dare to believe and try to think, are mirrored not only in their clothing, but also in their shining eyes. They pause in their dancing and stand in front of me. Kindred, they whisper kindly. And for a moment, just a moment, I feel euphoric. A wonderful realization that I am looking into the eyes of God flits into my heart. In confusion, I glance at the theological box that we built around God. Don't worry, my new friend laughs, making a face to draw my eyes back to them. We'll get to that ugly thing in the end. Glancing at the box and back at my friend, I realized that the walls and cages that we struggled to build are actually quite ugly now. They seem misshapen, lacking something, something essential. I look back at my friend, their mirrors glimmering with grace and hope. But I can't reach you, I murmur, dismayed. Let me, they suggest confidently. They carefully uncurl each of my stiff fingers and slowly lift the boxes out of my open hands. Setting my boxes down in a fragrant bed of brightly colored flowers, they blow on my hands, warming them. And we sit down together on either side of the boxes. They take out a tool that I've never seen before and begin to pry open the boxes as I watch in awe and wonder. Holding my past in both hands, they show me who I was and they accept all of me. I look at the scenes with new eyes, fresh tears springing up as I realize what I have done by rejecting my very roots. They offer me my story and I take it from them reverently and begin to rewrite my present from the roots upwards. I smile a little. Here I am.
Then they pick up my mind, struggling to hold the wisps of it as it curls around their fingers, searching for flesh. Suddenly I understand. I am held in grace. I do not need to be ashamed. I reach out for my mind and it enters me, entwining with each molecule of flesh, becoming me. I look in the mirrors that my chosen kin holds up and I see myself as I am becoming. As I look around, I see other people sitting in pairs and small groups, boxes discarded all around them. They are laughing and talking, playing together freely, mirrors glinting in the sunlight. The last box in the midst of us rocks slightly, as if daring us to go one step further. We've deconstructed our own boxes and embraced our authentic selves. Don't we owe God the same courtesy? So joining hands as one diverse, messy, complex, wonderful body, we approach the box and start to read the bricks and bars. Each of those theological words that once sounded so strong, each concept that once felt so right, now seems incomplete, insufficient, in the warm hands of real human bodies who matter so much more. We don't discard the words, we set them aside ready to examine later, ready to create something new, something better, something more fitting. As the bars are removed, we begin to see more and more of God. The part of the God who looks like us reaches out their wounded hands. In return, we reveal our wounds and scars. They come to join us, holding each of us in love. The part of God who looks a bit like my mum smiles generously and walks over to a pile of bricks. Sitting down with their legs crossed, they begin to play with the bricks, laying out lots of creative new designs. The part of God who looks nothing like us swirls around our heads in bright colours and extraordinary sounds, composing a rainbow of music that tastes like sheer joy. Following its motion, we begin once more to dance, together mirroring each other and God. We are no longer hiding behind masks of uniformity. Instead, we wear our diversity authentically. We are no longer separated by boxes of division. Instead, we enjoy our unity together. May it be so. So if you want to know the academic equivalent of that, you'll have to either buy the book come May um, or ask me for these bits of paper um, and you can read it for yourself. But I'm not going to, to read the more academic version. But effectively, that story, I think, is kind of emblematic both of the details of the theology um, that I discerned during my PhD, but also of the change that occurred in me, because I never would have written like that before my PhD, and I certainly wouldn't have stood up here and spoken like that um, before my PhD. Um, so I gained a kind of courage to let go, um, and a kind of courage to see myself in a way that embodied grace through this process of speaking with other people who are both very alike and very different from me. And I kind of think, at least personally, that that was significantly more important than any of the academic stuff. Um, so finally, what next for trans theology? Um, this is gonna be really quick. I think we need to move beyond apologetics. So beyond the kind of, why is it okay to be trans? Um, those arguments have been made and made and made and made and made. Um, and if no one's listening still, then like, just why are we arguing? What's the point of the debate? Um, recently, I decided to stop doing debates. So if anyone's thinking of inviting me to debate with someone, I won't show up. Um, I just don't do it. It doesn't mean I'm not willing to hear contrary views, but I think that debate or argument is one of the worst ways to hold conversations with each other. I think we need more trans-written trans theology. That doesn't mean that I don't think that cis people or people who aren't trans shouldn't write trans theology. Um, we need both, um, but we do need to be encouraging trans and non-binary people. 
uh, the theology departments at universities are still really lacking trans and non-binary people. Um, it's still harder to study theology at university if you're trans or non-binary than if you're not. Um, so we need to be encouraging and supporting trans and non-binary people to be able to share their views. We need trans and cis theologians working together. Um, there's a book, it's called The Gender Agenda. It's, it's positive about trans people, but you probably shouldn't read it because it was written by someone without talking to a single trans person. Um, that's not the way to write about being trans. We need stuff that's written together in conversation. In more practical terms, a couple of things are happening. So in Exeter, uh, or out of Exeter, Susanna Cornwall is setting up a network for trans and non-binary theologians around the UK, and cis theologians who are writing trans and non-binary theology. So if you're interested in that, um, get in touch with Susanna. She's not started kind of searching for people yet, but it's gonna happen, and I think it's gonna be a good thing, um, because it's a way in which we can kind of lobby for universities, I guess, to do more um, to support and fund trans and non-binary theologians, um, to publish more work, um, to have chairs in departments, things like that, um, that actually practically make it possible um, to be out there doing that stuff. Um, in Oxford and in York, um, in both of those universities, people are working on trans-related practical theology together with ministers. Um, but then I actually think um, that this is something that needs to carry on um, everywhere. There are still barriers um, in all churches, all denominations, uh, all universities and departments for trans and non-binary people um, to be able to make ourselves heard. And one of the important steps in that, I think, is trans and non-binary people being invited to talk and write about things that aren't only about being trans. Um, I get contacted all the time from editors saying, can you write such and such from a trans perspective? Um, and that's fine, but you know, there's other things about me too. Um, so I think over time we need to move towards kind of seeing the humanity um, of every person and hearing every person's voice. And I just want to leave you again with this quote um, from one of my interview participants who said, for me, God is sprinkling breadcrumbs of delight and transition is all about following those breadcrumbs of delight. So whoever you are, however you identify, um, wherever you're going from here, maybe that's a kind of blessing that you can take with you to try to follow breadcrumbs of delight um, as you uh, go on your journey.